Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs on most Thursdays, so please check out the Figgy's website for information on upcoming programs. We're able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Thank you, Chris and Mary. While these programs are free to watch, I do encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your support as a Figgy member is vital to the museum now more than ever, and it helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. For those of you who are ready to visit the Figgy's galleries, we're open and we recommend that you check out the Figgy's website, which has information on updated policies. A quick note, in case you hadn't heard, the cafe is temporarily closed. So if you're hoping to visit the museum and grab a bite to eat, definitely make sure to check that website first. We'll have information and keep it current up in a banner on the website about the cafe. So for tonight's program, we welcome your questions. Please feel free to type those into the Q&A at any time during the program, and we'll respond to them as we can. And for those of you who are watching through Facebook, you can leave your questions in the streams post, and I'll be sure to transfer those over. So at this time, it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Joshua Johnson, the Figgy's Assistant Registrar and Preparator and Curator of the Exhibition we'll be exploring this evening. Joshua, thank you and, uh, for joining us tonight. Sorry, the uh, mute button always flummoxes me a bit. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Melissa said, I'm the Assistant Registrar here, and I also have the pleasure of curating this exhibition. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the museum and have seen it, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to, you know, where this actually lives in physical space, since we're only kind of looking at it virtually tonight. Um, so this is our orientation gallery at the Figgy. It's the first gallery you would kind of walk into after leaving our main lobby. Uh, and we wanted to put an exhibition in this space that would really act in some ways as kind of an introduction to one of our kind of um, collection strategies. Um, so many people affiliate the Figgy with people like Grant Wood and the other regionalists. Um, and so because of that affiliation, we always are kind of thinking about ways to kind of grow the collection in ways that is associated not only with the regionalists, but other artists of the new American, of the American scene, which is what we're gonna talk about here in a minute. Um, and so we wanted to theme an exhibition around these recent acquisitions that are by, you know, mainly modern and contemporary artists uh, that have this association to the themes the artists of the American scene explored, um, but are really putting it into a contemporary lens. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it's a relatively small gallery. There's only 15 works in the entire exhibition, not all of which you can see in this photo. Um, but it really does represent a kind of range of medium and also the way the collection is continuing to expand. You know, in this shot alone, we have oil painting and ceramics and photography, but also in the exhibition, we have examples of video work and also plaster casts and also uh, screen printing. So we have all these different mediums and, you know, interacting in the same space. And it's exciting to do these thematic exhibitions because you never would otherwise get to see these different works together because they would be separated by time period or medium. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight is, you know, what is the American scene? If we're talking about the new American scene, we probably need to first start by defining what that term means. And the easiest answer is the term is pretty loose. Um, it's more of a kind of, it's not so much an art movement as more of a kind of general term that applies to artists uh, and their artwork in the early half of the 20th century um, that were dealing with specifically American subject matter and were working representationally, typically in painting, but also as you can see from the works on the screen, also working in printmaking and other associated mediums and drawing. And they were really, those artists, you know, were kind of separated into two camps. We had the regionalists that I mentioned, and those are figures that we're very familiar with here at the, at the Figgy, you know, people like Grant Wood, Thomas Hart Benton, uh, John Stuart Curry. And then we also have people working in the social realist vein. And, you, and I should first define what the regionalists were doing. The regionalists, you know, they were looking more towards rural Midwestern scenes than kind of the heart of, of America. Um, 
scenes that were celebrating farm life, scenes that were celebrating, you know, agricultural working. And they were seeing this as in many ways, a kind of response to the Great Depression as a sign of, you know, showing America's ability to kind of get itself back on its feet by celebrating these things, uh, scenes of American labor. Don't mind that the lights went off behind me. I'm filming this from our collections offices and because things are light sensitive when there's not movement, the lights turn off. So don't mind that. Um, the other group that is affiliated with the term the new American scene is of course the social realists. These were people like uh, Martin Lewis and Peggy Bacon and of course Edward Hopper and they were more fa focused on scenes in city life, um, scenes that are showing what it was like to be living in the city and not necessarily the upper echelons of society, but the people who were building the skyscrapers, who were, you know, eating in Hopper's cafes or who were, you know, kind of sitting around in Peggy Bacon's uh, clam bake here. Um, and I should explain why I've chosen these images that are on the screen here. You know, these are all examples of, you know, the American scene that the Figgy has collected within the last six years. So it's not only these modern and contemporary artists that we are, are seeking to collect that are dealing with the themes of the American scene. We're also dealing with, you know, the original, um, you know, the original American scene artists that you, you see before you. So these, these are exciting recent additions. Of course, none of these are in this exhibition, but I wanted to use them as a preface to um, what the American scene is. Now, the reason that we chose to kind of highlight this exhibition in terms of the American scene is we wanted to show how that term can kind of broaden in a more modern and contemporary sense. You know, most of the artists that are affiliated with the American scene were, you know, Caucasian and were male and heterosexual. And so we wanted to show that, and you know, so because of that, their works of art really were created from that viewpoint. Now, within this new exhibition, we wanted to broaden that. We wanted to include, you know, uh, artists of color. We wanted to include more women artists. We wanted to show a broader range of experience that is more representative of America now and was really more representative of what America was then, but it wasn't shown in the works that were represented necessarily by the new American scene artists. To a certain extent, the social realists were dealing with some of these things uh, and being more critical of uh, societal issues, uh, but in general, artists affiliated with American scene were less critical. Now, what you'll see in a lot of the works by the modern contemporary artists that are included in the exhibition, they are taking a more of a, a critical um, view of some of the issues that are facing America and continue to face America. But it's never from a, you know, while they're right, they're absolutely, you know, these are issues that need to be grappled with. They're not raising these issues out of malice, these artists speaking for them in particular, but instead what groups all of the contemporary and modern artists that we're gonna look at tonight together is really a strong sense of an appreciation of their community within America. And an appreciation for the people who live in that community and are, are kind of surrounding their studios in their daily life. And that's what really what grouped this, this selection of artists together. So even though they're dealing with issues of you know, racism, classism, sexism, uh, homophobia, other issues that are, are, are dealt with in some of the imagery in, in these works, they're never approaching it necessarily from malice. It's more of a, here's something wrong, but still I love some of these people that I'm representing. So, and you, that will become more clear as we kind of work through some of the individual works within the exhibition. Uh, something else just to mention too, the original American scene artists were that term is most usually applied to painters, as I mentioned. So we also wanted to kind of broaden to show what does it look like to apply, you know, American scene kind of thought to a broader range of medium, as, as I mentioned in the, in the first slide. The first two artists that I wanted to kind of show you all tonight were Frank Pollan and Richard Estes. And as I mentioned in that first slide, one of the things that thematic exhibitions like this allow us to do is to group artists together that would not necessarily show next to each other otherwise because of differences in time period or differences in medium or just generally not being associated with one another. However, in exhibitions like this, it allows us to make these kind of visual comparisons between these works that share so much. Um, so on the left, we have photographer Frank Pollan who was one of the um, 
associated with, I'm sorry, was, grew up in the area around uh, Chicago and New York City, had been born in Pittsburgh, and so was just very much ingrained in city life. Um, and that really is the linking point between all of his photographs is this kind of love of living in the city, um, which is evident in this photograph. His first real experience with photography comes while he was serving in the army during World War II. As an army photographer, he was responsible for photographing some of the de devastating impact of the war on German cities. And then after he comes back and he, he gets his photographic education from the Art Institute of Chicago and the Institute of Design and the New School, I should mention all of these classes, by the way, he's taking at night so that he can work as a fashion illustrator during the day. Uh, and so he can kind of, you know, make a living. He, he's taking all these classes at night in photography. And that's also when he's, he, you know, he's photographing these street scenes of New York City. And a lot of his works are going to be scenes of, you know, light, nightlife in the area around Times Square. However, he also takes scenes like this, where it's just this, this store window. And what he's done is he has captured the store window at such a time that the light is hitting it just right where it is reflecting the buildings that are on the other side of the street, while also still allowing the viewer to see the shirt that is displayed inside. And that's something that would have been very kind of relevant to the artist on the right, um, not only in the slide, but also where it is hung in the exhibition, uh, Richard Estes. Uh, Richard Estes is one of the founding members of the photorealism movement. And for people who aren't necessarily familiar with that term, it was an, a movement in painting specifically that was trying to render photorealistic detail on the surface of their paintings using photography as a reference point. So not necessarily painting from life, but using the photo as reference for the purpose of being able to capture details that you wouldn't be able to if you were uh, capturing something, painting from life. And also being able to kind of play with that level of depth of detail. And this is going to include people like Audrey Flack and Chuck Close and Robert Cottingham. And so Richard Estes is one of the really founding members of this group. His focus is going to be a little different than some of his contemporaries because while a lot of the other members of the uh, who are interested in photorealism are going to be kind of tied to the photographs that they're referencing. Estes is nearly always going to be kind of manipulating in some way what he's he's taking these photographs of. Um, and that's very much evident in a scene like this. This is Big Diamonds from the portfolio, Urban Landscapes number two. And in this scene, it, this is quintessentially often what we see in an Estes. He is taking these store windows and playing with what is reflected back by the almost mirror-like surfaces and what you can see behind. And because of the way that these glass panes overlap with each other, it almost becomes this kind of abstract arrangement of line and color, but it's still, you just know, photorealistic image. And that was kind of quintessentially what um, Estes was 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 searching for uh, were these scenes like this. He, he primarily works in the area around um, New York City, though he also does have scenes that were taken, uh, that he painted in uh, Venice and also Florence and Rome and other European cities, as well as other uh, parts of the United States. And he tends to depict scenes of kind of average street life, like this little inlet in this kind of um, modernist shopping ar arcade here, um, instead of, you know, very famous buildings, although he does have images of the Guggenheim and reflections of the, the Flatiron building in some of his works. Um, it should be mentioned, his, his interest in architecture is not kind of accidental. Um, he had originally planned to study architecture, but because of a um, uh, a trip to Europe, he ended up messing the uh, entrance date uh, for the School of Architecture. So he ended up getting his uh, BFA from the Art Institute of Chicago instead, and that kind of changed his whole life. Um, and I should mention too, him, you know, another connection between Estes and Paulin is that Estes was also uh, having to work as a, um, as a designer, as a graphic designer, to support himself initially before being able to turn to painting completely. So you see both of these uh, men working in the area around New York City, 
dealing with these reflections, having kind of a similar background and having to support themselves through working in either uh, fashion uh, illustration for Frank Pollan or graphic design for Estes, and then being able to then move towards focusing on more what they wanted to their independent practices and having this connection between them. Anyway, this is one of my probably favorite pairings in the exhibition, just because I feel like there's so much going on visually between them and there's so many similarities and so much to talk about. Oopsie. Um, the next, and uh, I should mention too, you know, with these being recent acquisitions, a lot of these works have never been exhibited before, um, or at least never exhibited as at, once they've been added to the Figgy's collection. There are some works that were on view either as part of a, um, a rotating exhibition or an exhibition we put together and have subsequently been added to the Figgy collection. But a lot of these things have, have never been seen by the public at the Figgy before. And that's very much true of this piece by Adolf Rosenblatt. Um, so Adolf Rosenblatt was a ceramicist who worked in the Milwaukee area. And his, the driving force of his work was his ability to really render these quintessential Milwaukeean scenes um, through his kind of intimate knowledge, not only of these places, but of the people that were living there. Um, and he really ingrained himself in this community. And you almost get the sense that it was a, you know, an artistic choice that by getting to know these people and these places better, he was going to be able to not render them necessarily as a caricature, but as someone who was kind of living amongst them. Um, and, you know, he did this for over 30 years. There's, there's a great quote from his wife talking about this that says, that's what Adolf has been doing for over the past 30 years, documenting life as it's lived in Milwaukee, in restaurants, movie houses, alleyways, gas stations, uh, trees are chopped down, buildings raised are renovated, people die, children grow up, but there they are still, almost alive before our eyes. And that's what makes these sculptures great. They are almost alive, done in a loose, energetic manner, sculptured, sculpted from life, excuse me. So that's from Susan Rosenblatt, the artist's wife. And she's talking about things that are, you know, quintessential to Rosenblatt's work, this idea of, you know, capturing the essence of these people and places. And a lot of, you know, the places that he sculpted are no, have, have been kind of um, torn down to make way for the expanse of Milwaukee as, as the, the, the city changes and grows. Um, and so these are the only records of what's left behind. And that's, you know, that's, possibly true of a place like Imperial Motors, the scene that we're seeing in front of us. So this is, what is it? It's a, it's a place, uh, I guess, a, an automobile shop where they're renovating the cars that you see. You see one raised and you see one lowered and they're putting a new engine block in. That's what the gentleman, let me see if I can. That's what the gentleman here is doing is getting the new engine ready to go into the car. Um, and these scenes, this kind of rough hewn ceramic is what Rosenblatt is very much known for, as well as these kind of vibrant colors that he paints everything in uh, after the ceramics have been uh, initially fired, which many of them were. Uh, we think this might be unfired clay, but we're not necessarily 100% positive. Um, but these scenes, you know, they're not, nothing in them is rectilinear. So even in the, those, these are representations of architecture, they feel as though they're, you know, they're moving and swaying as though they might topple over at the slightest uh, breeze. Um, but really these, these represent kind of a, an anomaly almost in some ways in ceramic sculpture in that most, most uh, ceramic sculptures tend not to focus on the landscape as a theme, but for Rosenblatt, he did this all the time. Uh, in addition to scenes that he had of interiors with uh, his, his most famous scene is probably My Balcony, in which he had 80 of these figures, um, all sculpted from life in his studio that inhabited the balcony of a movie theater getting ready for the, the movie to start. And that's probably his most famous uh, and as well as other kind of diner interiors and things like that. And I should mention, he was always seeking out people from the streets of Milwaukee and his friends and acquaintances to come and sit in his studio and he would sculpt them. And he was usually trying to seek them out sometimes in pairs or in groups so that he could show the natural relationship between these people. So that it wasn't forced or contrived. These are people who actually knew each other and would have surrounded each other. And that really comes through in the, in the relationships you see in the sculpture. Um, Talking about this piece in particular, and I, I do have a lot of quotes, so you'll see me continue to glance down because I don't want to misquote someone. Uh, and, but quote, 
I really wanted to, in the wall text of this exhibition, to include as many quotes from the artist as possible as was relevant, um, because I, I really wanted to have their voices heard talking about their communities. I thought that was important. But about Imperial Motors, he said, Im Im Imperial Motors is a walkthrough experience, like you're walking through a fun house. And at the same time, it's a garage. I dedicated Imperial Motors to my father. It had something to do with going to garages with my dad and sitting around and waiting. So, you know, this is an homage to um, Adolf Rosenblatt's father and the relationship he had when they went into spaces like this together. And this is many ways a remembrance, but it's not necessarily, you know, a memorial in that way. It can become very serious, but something Rosenblatt was very well known for was his sense of humor. And let me, let me show you what I mean uh, in the next slide. Maybe. Um, sorry, it wasn't letting me advance. Uh, this is the thing I wanted to show you here is the, the kind of funny hidden details in some of these images uh, from Rosenblatt. So here you can see there's just this little hole in the top of this nook of the garage and forgive the kind of snapshot esque photos here. These were taken in some haste, um, but back in this little area, you actually see the shop restroom and Rosenblatt has specifically cut off the ceiling of this little um, this little building that he's made so that you can see inside and see things like the toilet with the lid, the lid raised and see the, the man that is standing inside the restroom there. So you're getting this kind of private glimpse into this and there's little kind of humorous vignettes all throughout his work. Th things like people having plumber's cracks as they're working on things. Um, also the, the little... Uh, the little window here is another lovely vignette where it is showing the workers kind of having their lunch and taking a break and then kind of hiding from the, the customers and trying to hide, you know, take a respite from the labors of the day. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to show you, and you know, we're at such a disadvantage looking at something like this in a slide lecture. It, it really needs to be experienced in person so that you can walk around it. Um, but here are some of the different vantage points of of the sculpture, um, you know, all hand modeled in clay and really just kind of an incredible, you know, th this thing is really quite immense. Um, it's like uh, nearly four foot wide in one location and almost five in another. So it's, it's a really immense piece of clay. Um, anyway, I'll move on to the next. Um, so the next piece I wanted to talk to you about is this work by Michelangelo Lovelace, who is a contemporary artist painting and living in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he grew up in the King Kennedy housing projects. And this is a, you know, an economically impoverished and crime plagued area of central Cleveland. Um, and that, you know, that experience really permeates his, his works, uh, especially works like this. Um, and this, you know, his, his, some of his more recent scenes, um, well, more recent prior to this very most recent scene uh, are, you know, more optimistic, but this was painted at a time when he was really kind of feeling abandoned by not only the government of Cleveland, but also the business community and felt that his whole community was kind of uh, being left by the wayside as Cleveland develops. And you almost get a real sense of that from this, this painting, right? You know, it's called the Great Wall of Poverty. And there's this physical barrier uh, between the, the, these people on the street and the rest of what seems to be the sprawling city of Cleveland behind. And so this kind of metaphorical barrier of poverty, this notion that you, know, you can't do in the, a lot of the things you like or um, have a lot of the things you like or even necessarily visit the areas of the city you'd like to live in or certainly not even live in those areas has now become a physical barrier. The, the metaphorical wall of poverty has become a physical uh, wall of poverty. And you know, the things that are so interesting about this painting is you begin to notice all the like the literal writing on the wall, right? That things like phrases like the haves versus the have nots, and uh, you know that intermixed with the signs that are you know asking for money or um, or you know condemning. Um, 
certain political issues. And that is intermixed with kind of insane <laughs> imagery of things like babies crawling all around on the street. You notice there's with at least seven of them that I can see in view right here. And they seem to be completely unattended. And it's almost this cry out for, you know, yes, <laughs> the people are impoverished now, but think of the next generation as well. This notion of, you know, this is an ongoing generational thing, the impact of poverty. Um, and, you know, in talking about this work, he says, my paintings depict what it is like living in a community where anything can happen at any time and where life can often be fast, poor, and short. My paintings deal with many of the issues that affect poor inner city communities in the United States. Issues like poverty, crime, drugs, education, police brutality, healthcare, and other day-to-day -day happenings. Um, and so, you know, he, he's painting his own reality. This is, this is almost, you almost get the sense that he witnessed these all these different people on perhaps his, his walk to work or his walk to studio, and he combined them all into this one scene. And you almost kind of mirror that experience as you kind of view the painting and kind of almost walk next to it. Uh, again, this is a, a massive painting. I think it's almost uh, six foot, or no, it must be wider than that. <laughs> almost seven foot wide. Um, and he's someone who's very much engaged in contemporary issues. To give an example, his most recent round of paintings is dealing with uh, the coronavirus. He has actually worked for the past 30 years as a nurse's aide in a long-term um, long -term care facility. And he is now depicting some of the residents of that care facility and also the ways that they have been impacted by COVID-19. And so, you know, he, he's someone who's very much grappling with contemporary social issues, but always doing it from the perspective of a sense of compassion for the people he's depicting. Um, okay. And I should mention, these have all been kind of laid out in the order basically of where they are within the exhibition in terms of what's next to each other. So these visual connections between things like this, uh, the writing on the wall uh, in the Michelangelo Lovelace painting and the, you know, the signage that you're seeing in some of Paul D'Amato's imagery is not kind of accidental. Um, Paul D'Amato is a Chicago-based photographer, uh, a contemporary Chicago-based photographer. And the series that we're dealing with in particular is his imagery that he took in the area around Pilsen between 1989 and 2002. Now, for those who haven't been to the Pilsen area of Chicago, is uh, traditionally uh, affiliated with the uh, Latino community. And that was what Diamato was interested in kind of embedding himself with. Between that period, between 1989 and 2002, for the majority of that time, he actually lived in this Pilsen area. He specifically moved there for the purpose of photographing this this community and showing you know what has traditionally been a you know economically impoverished and kind of crime crime laden area but wanting to showing it not from an outsider's perspective but from someone who is actually a member of the community so that that's why he moved there um, he, of course, acknowledges that even though he had spent this length of time there, he was still ultimately photographing this to some extent as an outsider, despite his better attempts to kind of uh, get to know the community personally. He talks, he actually kept a journal during his entire time during this, um, this series of photos. And it, it's a really interesting record of his time there. Um, and it gives insight into the manner and in the ways that he was trying to integrate into this community. Um, to some extent, even, you know, often putting himself in, in, in harm's way because he didn't want to only photograph the kind of safer elements of the community, but the community as a whole. Um, there's the scene where he was trying in the journals where he's talking about trying to connect with some of the local gang members. Uh, so he reached out to some of the people that he had recently photographed, trying to ask, you know, where do these people meet? Where can I, where can I get to know them? How do I get to know them? And he's given some direction and he does, he does end up, end up eventually finding this, uh, the, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, the La Raza gang. And he ends up going on, you know, 
car rides with them. And he ends up, there's this particular scene in the journals where he's talking about being in the back of this panel van uh, while the uh, people around him are huffing spray paint and doing cocaine. And they ended up stopping at a particular point uh, to actually graffiti the side of a police car. And Paul D'Amato is there almost somewhat objectively, but also just kind of laughing alongside these people while photographing these scenes. And that's actually one of the scenes that uh, he captured is that, that graffiti scene. But to, it's not only uh, the more uh, kind of salacious elements of the community that he was interested in capturing. He also was photographing, you know, the businesses of the community and photographing, um, you know, storefronts and also things like this, um, what is ultimately a junkyard, but is also clearly selling uh, tires specifically. Um, and he was interested in capturing, he talks about capturing the, the place of Pilsen as well as the texture. So there's a lot of scenes that are deal dealing with specifically um, you know, architecture that is almost abandoned, architecture that has had graffiti on the side of it, um, but also, and that, that's what he's referring to as the texture of Pilsen. Um, but then for scenes of place, he wanted to, you know, photograph people either in their home or in their place of business. These places that are intimately connected to the people he's photographing. So it's not just, you know, picking some random person off the street. This is, this is, the person whose home this is, or this is the person whose storefront this is. Um, that doesn't necessarily refer to uh, this image of the screaming girl in the shopping cart necessarily. However, he was very bound to always have his camera with him so that when he happened upon scenes like this with, you know, this raking light coming in from the right and perfectly capturing this girl in this, in this tantrum in the shopping cart, he was able to capture those moments because he was always prepared to do so. Um, what's interesting is, is that between that period, between 1989 and 2002, the, the length of the series, Diamato really notices a change in that community. And I'll, I'll read you a little blurb about what he said it with, from the, within those journals. In 2001, when I moved back to Chicago after being away for a few years, the neighborhood, Pilsen, had already begun to irrever irrevocably change. Latte shops and restaurants were springing up along 18th Street, and tour buses made a loop through the neighborhood from Chinatown, two ethnic groups on one convenient bus ride. Through all of this, though all of this was a bit shocking, I had to accept that for a Mexican neighborhood called Pilsen, a legacy of its Bohemian, Polish, and German past, change is virtually encoded in its name. And so what he's talking about there is this, you know, Pilsen had traditionally been uh, a Bohemian, Polish, and German community, then it became a uh, Latin American community, and now it's transforming once again through gentrification. So he's almost there as a, um, you know, someone who is being affected by these changes because he's living there, but also as just kind of a uh, objective observer watching this community change uh, through this, this, this force of gentrification. Uh, the next, and you you probably picked up on already, but I, I'm really hammering home the connection between these artists and their community because that that is really the connecting point between all these artists. And it's you know, it's not an artificial one. These 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 artists are deeply connected, uh, d depicting either the community they live in, or um, and, and you'll see in a couple of slides ones that they've uh, traveled through for the distinct purpose of documenting specific communities. Anywho, um, so these are works by John A. Hearn. Um, these are another. You know, all of these are recent acquisitions. So I guess that goes without saying. Uh, these are particularly recent, only acquired in 2019. Um, but John Ainhern is a South Bronx sculptor who for the last 40 years has been doing life casts of the people of the South Bronx. Um, for people who are unfamiliar with life casting, for John Ainhern particularly, he's using a material called alginate, uh, which is actually a, um, it's made from seaweed, actually made into a fine powder that you mix with water. Um, if you've been to the dental's off dentist's office and had dental molds made, that's probably alginate if it was a pinkish, pinkish subject, substance. <laughs> in live casting, you will put the alginate all over the sitter, whatever you want to cast. Um, so in this case, you know, 
his sitters are actually going to have to have things like straws put into their nostrils so they continue to breathe as this material drives over them. And it dries relatively quickly, which is its benefit so that they don't have to stay encased like this, like for so long as you would with um, a plaster mold or something like that. But it, its disadvantage is that it, it dries really quickly and it shrinks, so you need to get it off them pretty quickly and then instantaneously pla uh, cast plaster into it. Uh, and then it's a one-use mold. So you can make subsequent molds from that original that you make, um, but that original alginate mold is only usable once. Anyway, that's probably more into the technical than you need, but that's how he's making these things. And his interest in mold making actually came from uh, a book that he had on how movie props were made. And it was from that kind of um, introduction, because he originally was interested in becoming a, a prop artist himself, but through making these things, he, he became kind of more interested in the artistic side rather than working for, for movie studios and things like that. He is working a little bit different than kind of more traditional life casting in that he is actually manipulating the surface of his plaster casts afterwards. So after you cast the plaster in, normally you would be able to actually see all the details of things like the pores of the skin, uh, the wrinkles of the face, um, even down to, you know, <laughs> well, the pores of the skin is about as fine as I guess you get on a, a casting. Um, but Ahern is actually distorting some of that. So he will braid and sand the surface. You can see on uh, the shirt of the chief here that there's actually these uh, gouges into the shirt material. So he's he's manipulating these after the fact. So there are, this, there are these sections that look like real skin because they have, you know, they're capturing the pores and the details like that. And then there are sections that feel more kind of expressive that are showing the artist's mark making. So they become this intersection uh, both very lifelike and also kind of psychologically probing, using these mark making to kind of uh, give an, an internal portrait as well. And, you know, these these are real people from the neighborhood in which he lives. So he is he knows them. And so in sometimes he's he's capturing their their personality as well, or he's trying to. And, you know, <laughs> It makes you wonder what the personality and temperament was of perhaps Mad Crystal here, if maybe she was ha not having a particularly good day. Um, that, um, that focus on the individuality of the theater is really important to him. In, in talking about these works, Ahern said, for me, it was kind of special to be able to let a person trust you so you could pour the stuff on their faces. You start with zero, nothing, and then you make something. You get much closer in a sense, more personal. And, and he's right. There's this kind of intimacy that comes with being able to uh, trust someone to put this goop all over your face uh, and trust that they're going to make a likeness of you and not just be pulling some kind of weird prank or something. Um, it, it, should, it should be mentioned that, you know, his artwork appears not only in major museums, but also throughout the streets of the South Bronx. Um, he, his works are embedded in some of the building walls there. Uh, a lot of the residents have portraits of themselves made by Ahern. Um, that is not to say that he is without controversy in that community. Um, recently, he was commissioned by the city to create bronze uh, statues for some of the street corners. Um, and one of his, his sculptures um, actually landed him in some hot water because of the the portrayal of an individual, it was a, the individual. And so this, this questioning of who has the, what is the prior, correct representation of a community and who gets to decide what the sculptures are, that's an ongoing conversation, one that Ahern was interested in. And, and it's particularly uh, interesting to talk about that because Ahern initially, and his, uh, um, his partner, Rigoberto Torres, they were initially interested in kind of decommercializing art, right? And making it more for the people. So that's why he was doing these uh, sculptures that exist on the walls of the Bronx, but also taking the process of the art making out onto the streets. So he, will, he would have lines outside his studio and outside galleries in the Bronx where he would be showing the process of making these life castings. And so it was kind of demystifying this process and also, you know, bringing down the wall between, you know, a person viewing art and someone making it, well, now you were part of the process because you might have been a model for it. Anyway, um, moving on to the next. So um, a lot of you may have seen 
this work in its original context. This is by Jefferson Pinder, a uh, Chicago-based sculptor, performance artist, video artist, and you know a million other. Uh, he he knows no bounds in terms of medium. Um, but you may have seen this in the 2017 exhibition here at the Figgy called Ghost Light. Um, that exhibition, like so many of Pinder's, are an exploration of the African American experience. But usually he is doing these exhibitions in such a way that they are specific to the experience of the community in which he exhibited them. And that was very true and is true of, of this piece and also the exhibition that was here at the Figgy. His working method involves learning about a community, not only through you know, deep historical research, which he did you know, through the internet and through scholarly articles about this community, but also literally going out onto the streets and finding people who have this kind of oral history of what has happened in this community and then creating works that are inspired by that story. Uh, so for the exhibition at the Figgy, he almost ended up creating what was set pieces that acted as the background for the performances that told the story of the African-American experience in the Quad City region. Um, and one of the stories that came to light through his research and through that conversation uh, was the events surrounding a uh, riot that broke out at Rock Island High School in the fall of 1972 that was uh, a riot circling around uh, issues of race. Um, and so there was a performance in, in the same section of the gallery that this was that was a conversation between two people who had lived through that, um, that riot. Now this piece is not those same two actors, but is instead in some ways Jefferson, or not, those weren't actors, those were people who had actually lived through it. These are kind of more um, standing in in some ways. But in this piece, there's no sound at all. There, it, despite being called the conversation, there's no speaking, there's no words to be had. Instead, this is a video in which the two sitters here seem to just stare at each other. Of course, they're not actually staring at each other because they're not even in the in the same room, but there's this sense that they're looking at each other because of this the way that they're paired in the video. And they seem to be sizing each other up, right? There, there seems to be this almost jockeying for position that's happening um, between them and their body language, very much on guard, a very much... Um, maybe not so much defensive as though, but just ready to kind of respond. And you get the sense that at any moment they might speak and interact with each other, but it perhaps becomes even more poignant because no conversation is ever had between them. Nothing is resolved. They're just in this constant loop of looking back and forth at each other for perpetuity. But again, an another artist with a deep, who is making a deep connection to a community in order to you know, display what kind of American life is like. And that's, you know, quintessential to what the American scene artists were talking about in the first half of the 20th century. And that's, you know, what was themed uh, pulling this exhibition together. Uh, another artist that will be very familiar to um, frequent visitors to the Figgy. Uh, this is a piece by Rose Franson. Uh, this is spring corn. Um, if you saw the most recent installation of the portrait of Makokata uh, installation in, in 2016, then you will be familiar with this piece as it was displayed there. Uh, excuse me, 2017. Um, Rose Franson is, of course, a Makokata based uh, painter who has really dedicated all of her extensive artistic talents to portraying in paint the kind of faces and personalities of this particular region of the Midwest. Um, and, you know, that probably comes the most to bear in things like Portrait of the portrait of Makokata, where she did 180 different portraits of the members of the Makokata community and combined them with this you know, beautiful landscape of Makokata. But that also rings true in basically all of her work. Um, and you, know, you can really feel it in a sense like this. Her sitters are people that she knows. They're people that live in her community, or in this case, they're even relations to her. Uh, and so there's this real intimacy between painter and sitter that comes across. Um, this scene is a bit of a departure for Franson in some ways, in that typically, you know, she's working from observation, so she's, you know, looking at the person directly in front of them, and so she tends previously not to have manipulated the scenery as much, but in this scene, you know, it almost becomes surrealist, right? There's corn that is springing up from the floorboards, and you, it's this juxtaposition between 
these seedlings of corn, this kind of new growth. And here is the elderly farmer at the end of his life. So the land that he has farmed is springing anew while he himself is ready to kind of, you know, shuffle off the coil for lack of better words. Um, in talking about this piece, uh, Rose Franson said, Uncle Ken's weathered arms, feet, and body, his revealed pacemaker, and collusion and contrast to his expression are all elements I want the viewer to interpret. Rhythms of his chest like the rhythms of the landscape, his feet, veins like roots in the dirt and on the floor also are intended to be interpreted, perhaps revealing a sense of memory of knowable and unknowable places, his past, present, and future. So, you know, like I said, linking his mortality with the kind of rejuvenative aspects of this land, the, the, the cyclical nature of life that, that comes through in farming. Um, and she's an artist that is very much aware of her connection to the American scene, uh, specifically to the regionalists. Um, in talking about this work, she said, it's a 21st century continuation of the concert conversation the regionalists were having with their time and our Midwest culture. So again, she is very much aware of the connection that we're making to this kind of idea of what a new American scene would look like. Okay. Uh, these two photographs are by Larry Silver. Um, Larry Silver is probably best known for his scenes of, you know, Muscle Beach in uh, Los Angeles that he photographed while at the uh, Art Center School there under full scholarship. Um, and, you know, his scenes of Mus Muscle Beach are kind of quintessential Americana. Uh, and also his more recent scenes of Connecticut where he has lived for the past um, 47 years. However, what is perhaps less known is the series that he did in Minden, Iowa, uh, while working to some extent as a commercial uh, photographer. Um, so he's one of the artists within this exhibition that aren't necessarily from the community that they're depicting, but are still very much interested in depicting what aspects of American life look like. Uh, and that's something that really ties all of Silver's work together is this sense of this connection between the people who he's depicting and the place that they are. Uh, so in both of these scenes, you know, we have a farmer and a son with these corn silos behind him. And then we have also uh, farmer Gerald Siebels uh, also standing in front of the corn cribs that are behind them. This very literal connection between the farmer and the land uh, that Silver is making. Um, you know, Silver's artistic background, he was associated uh, with the photography league, people like, uh, Eugene Smith, uh, Lou Bernstein, and other members of this kind of uh, infamous group of New York-based photographers. And that was while he was in, the, uh, in high school at the High School of Industrial Arts in Manhattan. So from a very young age, photography is kind of in his blood. Um, and that you know, continues to this day, although more recently his photographs has transitioned from uh, scenes kind of documenting American life like this one to scenes of um, actually abstractions of water that he's manipulating in the dark room. So a kind of late in life switch for Larry Silver, but the majority of his body of work deals with subject matter like this. Uh, another photographer whose connection uh, to the people she's documenting is not as direct as some of the ones we've looked at, um, but it is nevertheless, you know, capturing these kind of quintessential Americana moments. Um, so again, this is a, a photograph that might be familiar to some of you if you saw the Overbeek exhibition that was in the Katz Gallery here at the Figgy. Um, to give you a little background of this project that Overbeek embarked upon, she's a Dutch photographer and she actually traced the Mississippi. But the reason she did so was because her father had 25 years before her, Ernoot Overbeek had actually followed the same route along the Mississippi while under uh, commission from the Dutch magazine Avenue to kind of document life along this kind of infamous river. Um, so Tesca Overbeek sought to kind of recapture her father's journey and return to some of those same locales. Now, this is very interesting for her personally because at the time that Air Newt Overbeek was taking these photographs along the Mississippi, he had brought his then wife with him and it was kind of in the last stages of their marriages before divorce. So for Tesca, she was revisiting this project that had really in some ways represented the breakup of her parents' marriage and she was visiting it 
at a time when she herself was about ready to embark upon marriage. She was, she was engaged and, and due to be wed. Um, and so these photographs are very personally fraught for her, but from a kind of um, social standpoint, you're looking at these photographs, Ernoots, which were made 25 years earlier, and Tesca's that were made in 2013, and there's not a lot of difference in these communities. Things haven't advanced in the way you might have thought they would. They haven't changed in the way that you would have thought they would. Uh, instead, it's almost remarkable for how much they stay the same. Um, and also, Tesca, like so many of the, the photographers that we're looking at tonight, is really remarkable for capturing these kind of snapshots that, you know, are, are so revealing. Um, in this photograph, for instance, you know, the children at play are, of course, endearing. And then you notice random things like the bag of potatoes that's just seemingly sitting unattended on the porch or the, the coat that's strewn on the ground or the fact that the only one that seems to be doing any of the lemonade stand work seems to be the little girl or the fact that they didn't have enough room for all the letters of lemonade, which is fantastic. Um, but it, capturing these kind of little moments like this, you know, you know, it, 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 they, they couldn't be any more quintessential Americana if Norman Rockwell had dreamed them up in his head. Um, but you know, that doesn't necessarily represent her own kind of personal fraught journey mimicking her father's. Okay, I know I've been talking for what it seems like a, a long time now, so I will uh, get through this last one and then we will open up to some questions. Um, so this is another, you know, incredibly recent acquisition, as I said, all of them are recent. Um, but a very exciting addition to the Figgies collection. This is by Mark Messersmith, a Florida-based uh, painter um, who really deals with the environment of the Florida bayou as it is impacted by the kind of ever-growing expanse of man, right? So in his paintings, we see this intersection between the natural kind of floral uh, flora and fauna. And then you get things like signs for a new Walmart popping up or a truck in this case, blazing through it. Um, and as you look at these paintings, you really get a sense of this kind of fraught tension that exists between the natural life that has always been there and what mankind is now forcing it to do. Uh, so Messer Smith talks about him wanting to document these scenes of of Florida wildlife that have been really pushed to the outskirts and pushed into these little pockets of, uh, of what remains of their natural habitat. And he's also specifically dealing with species that in some cases no longer exist in the wild, like the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker that we see on the central post here. Um, and there's all sorts of fascinating details and things like that. For instance, the ivory-billed woodpecker, as I mentioned, is extinct, but you notice in Messerschmitt's painting, it almost seems to be tied to the post, all, as almost as though he, one, hopes that they'll be rediscovered in the wild. There was actually a chance of that. Apparently in 2003, they saw some in Arkansas, but they haven't since seen any again. Um, but the sense that he's almost physically tying them there, like, no, you're going to stay, or as though they might be decoys, as though they're kind of repopulating uh, the natural world by just, you know, if we can't have the real thing, we'll strap some, um, some plastic ones to this post. Um, but other things that are fantastic about this painting, as I mentioned, the Walmart coming soon sign that is behind the trucker window. Uh, you also notice things like there's a skeleton sitting in the back of this car on the left with the alligator inexplicably strapped to the top. Um, you'll also notice that the scene, the painting itself, almost has a pseudo-religious air to it. Um, and I, the reason I'm saying that is, you know, the ornate gold, ornate-ish gold frame, the beautiful kind of um, glitterly white wildcats and dogs at the top with their kind of ruby eyes, the sense that it's almost been encrusted in jewels in the way that you might expect some kind of... Um, uh, altarpiece or um, uh, 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 altarpiece to be encrusted. And then specifically the Predellus boxes along the bottom. That, these are those the boxes along the lowered register and Predellus boxes in, in um, Renaissance art in, in altarpieces in general often told or illustrated parts of the main story that was going on above. So this, this connection between the two, almost like a comic strip in some way. Uh, what was the connection? And, and Messersmith is doing this very intentionally. Before, And I'll show you some of those, but I want to read you a little quote about his work from him. My work is not so much an indictment of, 
development, hunting, clear cutting, or carnage of the animals on our back roads and highways, but more of a prompt to steer we human sinners, and he puts that in quotations there, from our current road to perdition back on a path to righteousness, towards stewardship of the, and again, quotes here, natural environment. Uh, so he's not seeing this necessarily as a negative. He's just He's saying that we're on kind of a tipping point, and he wants to kind of draw attention to that in his artworks. Um, and again, forgive the snapshot aspect of some of these scenes of the Perdalis boxes, but I wanted to show you some close-ups of them. So this is the, the mixed media aspect of this. And all of these are kind of these dioramas built within these kind of plexiglass boxes, boxes, which is why there's so much reflection. But the reason I wanted to show you these is he's making some really interesting kind of art historical references here. Um, specifically, I wanted to talk about the one on the left. And actually, you, some of you may recognize the, and it's hard to see, but you see the religious figure kind of holding his hands out, right, towards this, this flock of uh, collaged birds. Um, that's actually Giotto's painting of uh, Francis of Assisi doing his uh, sermon to the birds, which is a, a real scene that exists. And it was a, from a biblical story of um, Francis being able to literally stop these birds, tell them, and when they stopped, tell them a whole sermon. And only when he's done did they fly away. And so, you know, by choosing this very interesting, also pseudo ridiculous scene from art history, Lester Smith is, is making this kind of noble struggle for the environment feel even grander than it is. And you'll notice things like this reoccurring image of the eye with these kind of radiating halos around it, this kind of all seeing eye, again, adding to this religious kind of uh, connection between them all. Um, also, you'll th see other uh, wildlife that he's included but besides the ivory billed woodpecker, uh, things like the blue macaw that you see, let me get the pen again, sorry. Uh, yeah, the blue macaw. Right, technology is hard. All right, it's not letting me. The blue macaw the, uh, on the top right in the gold circle at the left, um, that's another species that has since become extinct in the wild, was introduced to the Florida landscape either by accident of pets escaping or things from zoos, or they also think some of them might have been intentionally uh, let loose in order to repopulate. Uh, so there's an interesting story there. Of course, the, the lunar moth here, uh, the green moth in the, the center, he, you know, it's this beautiful imagery that also has the, uh, this eye symbol on its back. But I think Messersmith is also choosing it because of its fragility. Uh, lunar, these kind of moths only don't live long in adulthood. Once they are in their full on moth stage, they can't eat anymore, their, their mouth parts, I don't know the technical word, uh, are not developed enough where they can eat, so they perish very quickly. So he has this, you know, beautiful natural creature with these all-seeing eyes emblazoned on its back, inhabit his paintings with the sense that they are incredibly, incredibly temporary, and the fragility of all that kind of permeates the work. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's, uh, that's that. I'll, I'll turn it over to some questions. Joshua, I really don't know what to say. That was outstanding. I mean, the exhibition itself is stunning, but your passion for it really comes through. I'm, we're, I'm so grateful that you did this exhibition personally. And I know that that is true for our audience members here tonight and those who have been able to see it at the museum. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm gonna have you stop sharing your screen if you don't oh, mind. Yeah. And we'll go ahead and pull this up. We haven't had any questions come in yet, although you did cover a whole lot, so they may still be processing. Uh, let me move the view here for a second. Yeah, sorry I went a little long. <laughs> no, no, I think, I mean, I don't know. Everybody's still on the program, so my guess is that they were as intrigued as I have been too, so thank you for that. Um, we still don't have any, and I haven't seen any more coming through Facebook. There was one earlier on about scale, but you ended up answering it about a minute later. So if anybody does have any questions for Joshua, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat box. I recognize many of you on the program tonight. And of course, you have my email address because I sent you the link to get on the program. So if you do wake up in the middle of the night and have a burning question, go ahead and send that and we'll make, we'll make sure that Joshua gets that. 
Um, we're getting some praise coming in for you, Joshua. See, I wasn't lying. You did a wonderful job as always. Um, yeah, so please audience members go ahead and send any questions in that you have after the program is done. We'll make sure to get those answers to you. Joshua, again, thank you for sharing this wonderful exhibition and your insights and research tonight. It was just great. Um, I know our audience members are excited to see the exhibition in person if they haven't already. This is going to be on display at the Figgy through March 7th. And remember, for those of you who do plan to visit the museum in person, please remember to check out the Figgy's website for up-to-date information on those current policies and procedures. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We're going to be taking a break from Thursday programming next week. We hope you have a safe and delicious holiday. And we will look forward to seeing you at future programs. We are heading right into Member Appreciation Week. So back when I said that um, becoming a Figgy member really benefits us at the museum, it also can benefit you, especially during Member Appreciation Week and those double discounts in the store. So make sure to check that out. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you either through a program online or in the, per in the museum from six feet away sometime very soon. So take care and... We'll talk to you later. Thank you.